Good morning. And good morning to everybody who is out there watching and listening and joining us in worship from a lot of different places this morning. Um, when we add ourselves together, um, we are more than just different pieces. So thank you for joining us. A number of announcements. The first is already in our weekly bulletin. Um, we've discovered that because of construction and because of cold weather and icy roads and so forth, that adult Sunday school at 930 in the morning is a bit challenging for some people. So we've had some sessions in the evening and we're gonna do the same uh, today. Uh, not only did my class members get an invitation to this evening, but um, many other church members did also because we have a special guest this evening and uh, we hope we have a good response as we gather together at 6.30. So everyone is invited uh, to log on. Our special guest is Brian Damon. Uh, his entire career has been spent in law enforcement and we hope to have a great conversation amongst those who join us. Um, another announcement is that um, there will be both children's time and Sunday school next Sunday. Uh, that's our usual Sunday for those things. And also, um, for those of you who are pieces of our church leadership, I think you've all been informed about an online Zoom meeting tomorrow night with our trustees with capital funds campaign uh, committee members and other church leadership. We have a unique opportunity to meet with the contractor online tomorrow night at seven, uh, where he will update us as to what has been done in the building, uh, what the timetable is moving forward, uh, responding to our requests from some particular add-ons for which we'll be responsible and maybe even some frustration with our insurance company. So um, those are the announcements and the prayer concerns, except for one are the same as they have been, uh, but let me read them please. Uh, Otis Allison, Derwood Bodley, Bill Baldwin, Carol Cobb, Barbara Frank, um, Terry Foster's family um, connected to the Dahlbergs who are online with us, um, she was in hospice and passed away uh, in these recent days. Uh, Jason Markle, Barbara Martin, Charles and Lois Roberts, Jean Sinnott, Ward and Elizabeth Whitlock, and the new person on our list is Rita Lampman. I don't know any details except uh, Rita broke her ankle, uh, so uh, she's recovering from that. So that's our prayer concern list. Those are the announcements. And I'd invite us all together uh, to join in the call to worship. Out of the depths, we cry unto the Lord. We invite God to hear our prayers and supplications. Our souls thirst as they long for God's presence. Ever do we place our hope in God and the power of his steadfast love. Our opening hymn is number 158, Come Christians Join to Sing. Oh, yeah. 
Let's all pray together. Merciful God, what a gentle and healing balm you are as you listen to, forgive, and renew us. You take upon yourself our burdens and give us your strength. Submerge us in your spirit and grant us faith to perceive the good that arises from evil. Amen. John? Good morning, John. Good morning. I happen to be looking at old hymns and hymns that I wasn't familiar with uh, over the course of the week and uh, kind of accidentally uh, fell upon a, a hymn. And maybe you know it. I, I certainly don't. It's called, There is a Gate That Stands Ajar. Anybody? Li Shirley? No? no. John? Never. There is a gate that stands ajar. It's... Um, do you, oh. <laughs> He's going to sing a few more. Yeah. Uh, it was written by a uh, composer by the name of, uh, well, a poet, uh, by, by the name of Lydia Baxter. Lydia was born in 1809 in Petersburg, New York. And, and when, I, when I read that it was Petersburg, I got all excited because I thought it was right next door. Of course, that's Peter, Peter Borough. Uh, Petersburg is northeast of uh, Albany, right opposite Williamstown in Massachusetts. So it's still, it, we can still claim her as, as an upstater. Um, this hymn, uh, the text of this hymn is very compelling. I, I think it, you know, in the Bible, there are lots of doors, right, John, and, lot, and lots of gates, right? Yes. And um, it seems to me that the doors are the ones where we, we have agency. We can open them ourselves and we can go through. And, and it's best that we do if Jesus is on the other side knocking. But gates are, are points of, of limited access, actually. Um, you know, I, I guess in biblical times, uh, cities were surrounded by walls and it would be the gate through which you entered, entered the city if you, wanted, if you wanted to get inside. So the fact that this gate is left ajar, um, it probably signifies an opportunity on the part of the person uh, uh, expressing themselves, an opportunity uh, that ought not to be passed by at, and, and to get in, uh, get into wherever it is that they want to go. Um, uh, Lydia uh, Baxter was, uh, uh, she grew up in Petersburg and then she married and uh, moved to New York City. And she was for about 30 years uh, in very poor health. She was an invalid, but she um, nevertheless contributed uh, a, a lot of hymns, uh, many of which were Sunday school songs. And this, this one hymn, um, it has become very popular. I'm not sure it is now, but it did become very popular in England and especially in Scotland, interestingly. And this hymn, the text of this hymn has been translated into all sorts of languages. Uh, I was interested to see that the Scandinavians are particularly fond of, of this hymn. So, uh, there is a gate that stands ajar. <clears throat> there is a gate that stands ajar and through its portals gleaming a radiance from the cross afar, the Savior's love revealing. A depth of mercy can it be, that gate was left ajar for me, for me, for me. Was left ajar for me. The gate ajar stands free for all who seek through its salvation. The rich, the poor, the great and small of every tribe and nation. 
Oh, death, what mercy can it be? That gate was left ajar for me, for me, for me. Was left ajar for me. Press onward then, though foes may frown, while mercy's gate is open. Accept the cross and win the crown, love's everlasting token. O oh, death of mercy, can it be that gate was left ajar for me, for me, for me? Was left a jar for me. Beyond the river's brink we lay the cross that here is given, and bear the crown of life away and love him more in heaven. O oh, depth of mercy, can it be that gate was left a jar for me, for me? For me was left a jar for me. Well, John, if the old adage is true that uh, we like to learn something new each day, and none of us knew that song, and it's not even noontime, and we've learned something new already. Thank you. Sickness at the poolside. I got a telephone call last evening from one of our worshipers online with us, each week, he had seen the sermon title, and he's in the pool business. So he was calling to get a synopsis of what was going to be said this morning. And so we shared some silly pool stories together. But this one in John's gospel was not silly. And it is this. Jesus went to Jerusalem for a religious festival. Near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there is a pool with five porches. A large crowd of sick people were lying on the porches, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. A man was there who had been sick for 38 years. Jesus saw him lying there, and he knew that the man had been sick for such a long time, so he asked him, do you want to get well? The sick man answered, I don't have anyone here to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. While I'm trying to get in, somebody else gets there first. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Immediately, the man got well. He picked up his mat and started walking. The day this happened was a Sabbath. So the Jewish authorities told the man who had been healed, this is a Sabbath and it is against our law for you to carry your mat. And he answered, the man who made me well told me, to pick up my mat and walk. Let's pray. You who we call our Heavenly Father are a God of such power and wonder. We are awestruck by your abundant grace. We rejoice at what we can see, but we also marvel at what we cannot see. We know that you love us and nurture us, but also that you challenge us. And ever so, you strengthen and transform us. 
in spite of our busyness, when we're lonely, tired, overwhelmed, or lack resources, or see too much wrong in the world. Take all these reasons and overpower them with your love for us. Forgive us when we push your priorities aside and we are parched and thirsty because we fail to do justice or we are lacking in mercy or we forget to be humble. And yet you do not leave our thirst unquenched. You satisfy us if we but confess and admit our need of you. You, the author of the word made flesh, to whom belongs the first word and the last, open us again to your spirit, we pray. So hear our prayer we ask, and now hear us as we pray together silently. Jesus teaches us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We'll now have our morning offering.
riches accept the gifts of these your servants and grant that the work to which they are devoted may always prosper under your guidance. Amen. Our hymn is 367. Jesus met a man in Jerusalem who was unable to walk. Or perhaps he did so with great difficulty. Consider how challenging that would have been back in that day. For Jerusalem was a city built on steep hillsides, lots of stone steps without handrails no access ramps to assist mobility. People might have had crutches, but certainly no walkers, no wheelchairs. In John's narrative, Jesus met this man at poolside. The exact location had been debated forever, but that changed in June of the year 2004. During construction work to repair a large water pipe near the temple, archeologists discovered a set of stairs. As their work progressed, the excavation revealed that these steps were part of an ancient pool which existed during the time of Jesus. This was no wading pool that they discovered. It was huge, 393 feet long, 164 feet wide. That is the size of a football field. 
And there were five porticos, that is porches, that had been built to shelter the infirmed from the sun. Just like wounded soldiers on a battlefield, the frail and the feeble collected along this pool. They visited the pool intending to be healed because the pool was fed by a subterranean stream, which every now and again bubbled up and disturbed the waters. The belief was that the disturbance was caused by some divine action. And the first to plunge in after the disturbance, so it was said, recovered from whatever disease afflicted them. To some, all this may have been mere superstition. And yet, it was the kind of belief that was popular throughout that ancient world. The man in John's gospel had been sick his entire life. His sickness had a lifespan longer than many people lived in the first century, 38 years. He was alone, apparently with no family to assist him or comfort him. He spent his days gathered with other sick people around a pool that they thought was their only hope for healing. Lives utterly defined by illness, the blind, the lame, the crippled, all hoping for healing. They weren't well enough to be employed or pure enough to go to the temple. So their illness created its own kind of community for them. And the pool itself was the reason they gathered, that whoever got into the pool first, when the waters were disturbed, would be healed. For whatever the reason, on this particular day, Jesus was drawn to this place. And his eyes landed upon the main character of this miracle. Jesus asks an altogether odd question. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed? It's a cutting question. Actually, I've been visiting the sick since mid-1960s. Hospitals, nursing homes, assisted care facilities, but I have never not once asked the question, do you want to be healed? So why would Jesus even ask such a question? Was it the duration of the man's condition that prompted Jesus to ask? When Jesus asked that question, I want the man to answer, yes, for heaven's sake, yes. Instead, he tells Jesus why he hasn't been healed. His answer is part apology, part excuse, and part complaint. He says, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. What would it mean for that man to be made well. Oh, he'd have to become responsible for his life, wouldn't he? He'd have to invest fully in relationships. He could no longer be passive. He'd have to work for his food, and he'd have to participate fully in the world around him. So Jesus commands the man, get up, carry his mat, and walk away. Well, the Jewish leaders were upset, of course, because it was the Sabbath, and their way of seeing God's law further burdened the man, while Jesus' gift of healing set him free. It was an act that embodied God's grace and God's love. I wonder if we ever experience the same. 
lodged between a rock and a hard place, unable to escape, mired in resentment, bogged down in debt, trapped in a dead-end career, wallowing in the swamp of a miserable conflict, stuck. It's terrible to be stuck. Just ask the 18 people who rode a roller coaster in Anhui, China recently, inclement weather at the amusement park, brought the ride to a halt at the top of the loop, and 18 passengers were suspended upside down for half an hour. All were rescued, but six had to be hospitalized. And more recently at Song Mountain in Tully, skiers in lift chairs suspended 30 to 40 feet above the snowy ground because of a malfunction in the ski lift. For two anxiety-filled hours, they sat until lowered by ropes and rescued by ski patrol and local fire departments. The man in the biblical story was seriously, unquestionably, undeniably stuck. And then Jesus came along. Was the man ready for a new day, for a new way? Was he ready to get unstuck, to be dislodged, pried loose, unshackled, set free? Was the poolside no longer to be his permanent mailing address? Getting unstuck means getting excited about getting out. How about our society? How about us? No more waking up and going to sleep in the same mess. Time to write a new chapter in our personal biographies. Jesus does not ask us to list our reasons for not being healed. He asks whether we want to be healed. Jesus turned to that informed man and instructed him to stand up, carry his mat, and walk away. Arguably, composer Bill Gaither's most famous song is He Touched Me. He started composing in 1960, and this was his 54th song, and it even made an impact at the national level. Gaither tells about an accompanying elderly preacher friend of his, a very eloquent preacher, he said, and he advised Gaither saying this, Bill, the word touch is a very popular word. It comes up so often in the New Testament stories about Jesus touching to heal them or touching people's lives and changing them. It's a special spiritual word, and you ought to write a song that praises his touch. And so Bill Gaither did. And the song was first recorded in 1964. And in 1972, Elvis Presley made it the title track of his Grammy-winning gospel album. So the mission of Jesus the assumption of the gospel is that he can change lives. If you don't like yourself the way you are, you needn't stay that way. And yet we are alone, unable to put things right. The apostle Paul asked, who will rescue me? And he answered his own question. God rescues us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our call, likewise, comes in the command that we take action, that we take personal responsibility, 
with regards to our respective situations and that just like that man at the poolside, we stand up and we get moving. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. You who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Oh Lord, now let your servants depart in peace according to your gracious word. Our eyes have seen the glory of salvation prepared for all the people of the world. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you, and make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you, and give you blessed peace for now and evermore.